Hi, this is Into the Droid. My name is Thomas Cannon, so thanks for turning up to this talk. Yeah, I'm presenting this on an iPad for the first time, an Android talk on an iPad, so I've got my hipster bases and my geek bases fully covered today. Right. So why is this talk useful? Why should you care about it? So I'm going to talk about how to get into an Android device. Um, this is important if you live in an oppressive regime, um, like the UK, for instance. Um, <laughs> where you can be stopped and searched on the street and the UK have recently acquired some forensic equipment so that when they stop you on the street um, they can access your mobile phone and take your data off to then later see if it's useful. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about how, you know, how some of the technologies work there, how, uh, how these devices might work, how you can do it manually. Also important if you lose your device, um, what techniques black hats have available to them. I can't really talk about how to defend against these. The um, uh, company I work for, the clients, wouldn't really appreciate us uh, telling you how to prevent them getting at the data. But hopefully it'll give you some ideas. Okay, so the company, I work for Via Forensics based in Chicago. Um, I work in the UK, um, but the, the headquarters is in Chicago. Um, it's a mobile security and digital forensics. Um, we've got a strong R&D team, quite talented. And um, you may have heard my colleague uh, Jonathan Jarsky speak at Black Hat last week. Um, my name is Thomas Cannon. I'm the director of Breaking Things internally. Um, that's what I'm known as. But uh, my corporate title is Director of Research and Development. Um, so, yeah, you may have guessed I'm over from jolly old England. I came over for this uh, talk and I uh, missed the Olympics ceremony and the opening ceremony which was last night. I don't know if any of you guys saw it. I was quite interested to see how we could match the epic Chinese opening ceremony. And uh, so what did we do? Um, well, the Queen stepped up and they flew the Queen over the Olympic Stadium in a helicopter in her pink dress and uh, with James Bond. And uh, she jumped out of the helicopter and parachuted into the Olympic Stadium. That's true. I think that really captures the British spirit, you know. Um, our best ideas really come after about nine pints of beer. <laughs> so this presentation may or may not speak to that. Okay. And my day job is uh, reverse engineering Android applications for government, uh, corporate, um, blah, blah, blah. Challenges. Challenges of getting into Android devices. So ADB, I'm not going to go into detail about what that is, Android debug bridge, but it's, if it's enabled, it's a method of accessing your Android device over USB. You can, do, uh, you can get a shell up, you can get the data off. It's off by default. And from experience of dealing with um, real devices from real cases, it's usually off. Uh, screen lock, there's usually a screen lock on as well, and they can be, uh, they can be a pain. Code signing for updates. Um, so some of the techniques we're going to talk about uh, require code signing to be disabled because you can't just uh, load an update or load your own boot image. And encryption. I'm going to cover encryption and uh, how we attack it, how we uh, crack it, Android full device encryption. And there's a golden rule here. Android devices are very different at the level that we're talking about between the manufacturer uh, operating system version, model. A Galaxy S2 isn't just a Galaxy S2, there are different versions of them. So the golden rule here is when I talk about a technique, the implementation can actually vary. Um, your experience may differ from our experience. So bootloader essentials. We use a bootloader, bootloader to gain access to the device before the system fully boots. Um, we can use this under certain conditions to load our own boot image from where we can image the device uh, and get, get the data off the device. To get into the bootloader, accessing the bootloader, there's a number of ways. It usually requires um, a special combination of buttons, like a three-finger combo, which may be power up, hold it down, press the, uh, sorry, power, volume up, hold the power down, and you get into bootloader mode. Devi devices vary. It may require an extra hand or a Vulcan death grip, um, but you just Google it and you, you find out how to get into the bootloader. Um, also, from ADB, you can do ADB reboot bootloader, fast boot reboot bootloader. There's service jigs. There's a few ways. Protocols. 
Again, lots of different Android devices, different protocols, different methods of flashing them, loading RAM images. You've got RSD Lite for Motorola, SBF Flash Motorola, Fastboot, HTC, Google, Odin, or Heimdall for Samsung, Flash Tool for Sony. It's pretty challenging to support Android devices. So protection, there's either no protection or there's signature checks. You can only load the images that are signed by the manufacturer. If the device is rooted, there's a good chance that uh, it's unlocked as well. It's a nice backdoor access. But from experience, it's not common for devices to be rooted. I don't know, maybe, maybe criminals are not really into rooting their devices. Defeating the bootloader. I'm going to give an HTC example here. So in HTC land, they have S off and S on. That's security off and security on. If you, uh, if you boot into the bootloader, you can see if your device is S off or S on. S on by default meaning it's secure. Assuming we don't have access to modify or patch the bootloader, um, sorry, secu flag, uh, it's the flag, it's in radio firmware. This flag is then used in the bootloader stage to determine uh, if it's security on or, or off. So if we don't have access to modify the radio firmware or patch the bootloader, which you can do, you can patch the bootloader to ignore secu flag. How do we get in? Well, there's a gold card. It's a specially formatted micro SD card. Uh, you can use it to bypass the carrier ID check. Um, when you're flashing custom ROM. So this is one part of the equation. Also a white card. This is a manufacturer SIM card. It's really difficult to get hold of one. And it's used uh, in a sort of authentication token challenge response to get into the uh, sort of device diagnostics used by the factories. OK, so got a picture up on the screen. Um, you can ignore most of this. Uh, it was um, part of a, something else that I mentioned later. Um, but let's see. Can I get? A, we got a laser pointer, right? So here's the SIM card, um, and this is a, this is going off to a to a device that's emulating a SIM card in hardware. You've got a micro SD card uh, just up here. Um, this whole long thing here in this circuit is actually emulating a micro SD card, but you can actually use a real micro SD card. Um, this was used for a, um, a race a condition attack on the micro SD card I'll mention later. And then just some power over here, connected up. Okay, so we're emulating the micro, uh, we're emulating the white card and we've got our micro SD card in. Then when you go into bootloader mode, it will automatically pick this up and you can clear security, you can clear S on. White card is obviously not needed for CDMA phones because they don't have SIM cards. Once you have security off, you can RAM load a custom boot image, which I'll mention later. This technique wipes most devices. Wow, that's a bit of a problem. Um, but we actually tested it. You know, never believe everything you read. We tested it on some real devices and we were able to S off certain HTC devices, such as an HTC Desire, and the data was intact. You can try it yourself with an XTC clip. It's um, an enterprising hacker has produced a device to do just this for modding your phone, and, uh, and you can purchase it. So we have an unlocked or compliant bootloader. What do we do now? OK, so some forensics devices use this um, next technique. It's the, they create a custom boot image, a forensics boot image. You plug the phone into the device, it loads its custom boot image, and it pulls the data off. So we use a boot image uh, to boot the device early in the, early in the chain before the system loads. Um, we get a, a root shell over USB where we can load our tools and pull the data off. And importantly, because this is forensics, we don't want to modify anything. If you use a custom recovery image or custom boot image like Clockwork Mod, that's not forensically designed and it will modify data on some of the partitions, particularly the cache partition, which it auto mounts. So we need to be able to disable that if possible. And devices with raw NAND that typically have a YAFS2 file system, the wear leveling that spreads the data across the NAND flash to stop it wearing out is implemented in software in YAFS2. 
And that means that if we, if we get to it before EAF's two loads, we can prevent the wear leveling and prevent the modification of data. So if you're creating an image and you hash it one time, when you come back later, that hash is the same. You know, forensic analysts love that. On the screen there is just, um, okay, it's not gonna give me a laser pointer now, there we go. On the, screen, on the screen there is our custom boot image that we developed for a project. You can actually put a micro SD card in and press a menu button, it's point and click, and it will image the device onto the micro SD card. So let's build our own boot image. I can tell you it's really simple. There's an open source tool called A Boot Image for modifying boot images. So you get your custom recovery or your stock recovery, and the first command there extracts it. The second command unpacks the RAM disk. Then you change into the RAM disk directory. You edit the RAM disk contents, which is on the next, next slide. And then you pack it up again, and then you update the stock recovery and insert your custom RAM disk. So the RAM disk contents, you've got slash dev slash proc, which are empty directories. They're just used when it boots up to uh, mount things off. You've got the SBIN directory. All you need in there is ADBD, which is the ADB daemon, which is going to give you that shell over USB. BusyBox, if you like. If you know what BusyBox is, it's just a collection of tools, common Linux tools uh, in one binary. Uh, and we put NAND dump on as well, which is used for dumping partitions. We have our own modified version of NAND dump with some improvements that we're going to be contributing back um, to the, because it's an open source program slash sys, empty directory, init, don't have to touch that. And then there's a folder, a file called default.prop. So you edit that and you change ro.secure to zero and that'll give you a root shell. Init rc, you just change that, you comment everything out so it doesn't mount partitions. All you need to do is start adbd. And then you have u event d, uh, you don't need to modify that. And that's it, that's the contents of our RAM disk. That combined with the kernel, and there's your boot image. Flash and RAM load. It didn't sound that dirty when I wrote it. <laughs> right. Samsung, just a little aside here, there's a um, Samsung tool called Odin, or there's the open source Heimdall, and Odin version 1.52 or less, there's a command to dump partitions, which sounds awesome. Uh, we've never actually got it to work. All it seems to do is brick our phones. But if, um, <laughs> if anybody does get it to work, please, uh, please let me know, because we've got a stack of phones. Okay, so with Odin or Heimdall, you can flash your custom recovery image, you know, this being Android, e even, um, even with Samsung devices, there are different ways of doing that. You can see the two commands there. HTC has a fast boot, and the really cool thing about HTC with the fast boot, uh, or even Google devices, is you can RAM load it. That means you send your image over USB into RAM and it loads it. You don't have to flash or modify any data. Motorola has SBF flash. You can flash your image to the recovery partition. I should have pointed out not to the user data partition, obviously. Um, be careful with it when you flash Motorola that your SBF file only contains the uh, recovery partition, uh, otherwise you'll just wipe all the data off it. JTAG. So this is what the government labs use. You know, this is, this is really good stuff. So you have direct access to NAND chips via the CPU. I can't go into too much detail. You could have a whole day workshop just on JTAG. Um, but there are, on many devices, just going to get my laser pointer up. <clears throat> On many devices, you, you see these um, solder pads here, six points. So you solder some wires there, or you use a, a jig to connect to that, and you connect a flasher box. Um, those flasher boxes, are some examples there, ORT, RIF box, etc. And it allows you to image the the NAND flash directly through the CPU and you don't have to boot the device at all. So it helps to preserve data integrity. They can be pretty flaky, support is somewhat lacking, you know, the, these um, devices used in mobile repair shops and um, often come out of Eastern Europe, Russia and other very clever places. 
So if you don't have JTAG, are there some other options? Well, there's a serial debug cable. This is pretty cool. It's like JTAG, only a lot easier. So this is an S2 example. And as I mentioned earlier, not all S2s are the same. This also works for Galaxy Note. So in later ones, they've disabled the secondary bootloader that gives us this access. It hasn't been bundled, so it's probably a mistake by Samsung, and they've fixed it because hackers were taking advantage of it. So on the, on the S2 and the Note, you sold a, a 523 kilo ohm resistor. It doesn't have to be exact. I've tried um, a various values, and it seems to work. Between the ground pin, uh, the ground ID pin, sorry, solder between the ID pin and ground. Uh, and then on, you get TTL serial access over a couple of pins of the USB connector. You can use a bus pirate, which is a very cool way, um, or any kind of USB to serial converter. You attach directly and you get a serial console over USB, or over the USB connector. So there's a picture here of a, of a bus pirate and a little USB, micro USB breakout board and a resistor on a breadboard there. That's, that's all you need. So you set the bus pirate to 115-200 board, um, eight stop bits, no parity, sorry, eight bits, uh, no parity, one stop bit. Uh, the output type is normal. If you're using a bus pirate, there's an option. And you just plug the device into the micro USB and it'll automatically start booting. And first you see the primitive bootloader flash up, and then you see the secondary bootloader go crazy, and then the device boots. But if you hold down the enter key on the terminal while you plug the device in, you end up at a SBL prompt. This whole long list here to the right is a list of all the commands that you then have access to. So you, you essentially have a terminal on the secondary bootloader before the device is booted, which allows you access to the device. You can carry on booting the device. You just run the load kernel command, load modem command, and then boot command, and away it goes. It's a pretty cool way of accessing the device. OK, so some um, forensics devices used by law enforcement, they have this built in. It's plug and play. They plug your S2 in, uh, plug the USB cable in, and they can image your device straight off. doesn't matter if it's locked or, or what. Not the case if it's encrypted. We'll come to that later. Okay, so you've managed to get access to the device and image it. Why not crack the PIN or password? Well, a lot of people say, well, that's silly. You've already got the data. Why would you want to crack the lock screen PIN or password? But we got a lot of requests from customers wanting to do this. Maybe it's a time-sensitive investigation, um, such as a kidnapping, and they just want access to the device itself to get the data off it, export the data from the applications on the device. So there are a number of reasons why you want to do that. We first published this technique in Digital Forensics Magazine. It's a paid journal, so not everybody has access to it. There are now a number of blog posts about it. And uh, what I'm going to show here is also GPU acceleration, just to speed it up a bit. So the components, you've got a salt. That's stored in the file up there, settings.db. It's, a, it's an integer. Uh, so if you get the settings.db, you can do a SQL lookup on it and get the lock screen salt. The pin or password is actually stored in a password.key file. Again, golden rule, this is Android, locations can vary. And then the password file is actually a salted SHA-1 of the password, and that's added to a salted MD5. So you have a SHA-1 and you have an MD5, and they're put together. I don't know, maybe that looked more secure because it's longer, but all you need is the MD5 portion, right? So cracking it. First transform it into a, to the format we need, which is lowercase hex with no padding. There's a Python command there for you. Copy the 32 bytes of password.key, that's the MD5 hash in hex. Add a colon, then add the salt. And then you can just put it into software such as OCL Hashcat Lite. There's a screenshot of it. You can see um, the five positions where you configure it there, saying this is for cracking a pin number. So we're, we're looking at um, a sort of a short four to nine digit pin. And then there's a screenshots of pins actually cracked. It 
For a PIN, it takes seconds. For a password, it can take longer, depending on the length of the password. So that, that's the weakness there. But it, it's fairly easy. Hit brute force. You know, when I'm talking to people, they often say, oh, why don't you make a device that automatically types in the PIN lots of times? And I say, well, yeah, it's probably not going to work. Um, and this keeps happening in this conversation. So I thought, well, you know, why not do it and demonstrate why it does or does not work? So I've recorded a little video here. So you've got my Galaxy Note up on the screen. Um, plugged into that is a um, USB OTG cable that, um, because the Galaxy Note has USB host support. And then a little thing that looks like a thumb drive is actually an Atmel AVR chip, which I've programmed to emulate a keyboard. So if I'm going to click this, hopefully we get a video. Okay, didn't play. Let's try again. Oh, sorry, on my screen the video is not playing, on yours it is. Once more. Okay, so there I'm plugging the USB key in. It's automatically typing the password or a pin many, many times from 0 to 999. And then it locks out and you get a countdown timer. So it, it gives you 10 tries and then it brings up a countdown timer. So it's not really a very feasible attack. Maybe it is on some Android devices that, uh, that don't lock out. And uh, a little tip here if you want to try that. Um, if you're trying to prepare slides and you forget about it and leave it plugged in, it gets to the point where it's about to wipe your data. So don't try it on your real device either like I did. Yeah. Yeah. So this was, it was actually at the pre-boot authentication um, because my device is encrypted. So it's right at the start. And um, yeah, it will wipe your device after a certain number of times. So it rate limits it. It's not really a practical attack, but hey, it's cool. Android encryption. Here we go. So this is how we can, or can we, protect against this. So actually Android encryption is pretty good. Um, you'll notice somewhere on here, okay, somewhere on here it mentions a pin. So this is a Galaxy Nexus, uh, sorry, this is a Nexus S. And I'm setting up encryption on this device and it allows you to enter a pin, a four digit pin for encryption. Okay. Um, and then it takes a while and it goes ahead and it encrypts your device. It's been supported since Android 3, based on dmcrypt standard Linux, 128-bit AES, cipher block chaining. Implementations vary. We're looking at Samsung devices. They have their own key management module. It's done in a slightly different way. Okay, I think I better have a beer for this. Right. Android encryption. Okay, let's get my laser pointer. Password or PIN. So this is where your password or PIN comes in. It, it then runs through, uh, it derives your password, uh, sorry, derives your key based on your password, runs that through 2,000 iterations. The input is the key length 32. It's going to give you 32 bytes of output. You also need a salt. A salt is uh, de uh, derived from dev u random, so it's a random salt. The output of this, uh, 32 bytes, is the key and IV. It's split down the middle, so you end up with a 128-bit key and 128-bit IV. That feeds into AES128CBC, along with a master key, which is also derived from dev u random. The output is an encrypted 128-bit master key. Okay, so we have a master key, it's encrypted. One, once it's decrypted by the system, after you enter your password, this is how it uses it. It's de-encrypt with ESSIV. So ESSIV is encrypted salt sector initialization vector. It's used in block encryption for disks. Each sector here is 512 bytes, regardless of the file system. The IV for the first block of each sector 
is the sector number encrypted with a hash of the key. It prevents watermarking attacks, that kind of thing. Um, and then subsequent blocks in that sector use the IV of the previous blocks cipher text because it's cipher block chaining. Also, so your data goes in, your user data partition, what comes out is the encrypted user data partition. Cracking the encryption. So the encrypted master key in the salt is stored in a footer. That footer can be stored in a footer file, on a partition, or, or part of the uh, start of a partition itself. Uh, it depends on the device. So what we need to do is image the device, locate the footer, and then get the encrypted user data partition as well. So if you're using JTAG or the USB serial attack or um, even chip off a number of attacks like that or a number of processes like that, so you have your encrypted user data partition and you have your encrypted key and f um, yeah, your encrypted key. So we parse the footer, we locate the salt and the encrypted master key. We're going to brute force it. We run the password guess through PBKDF2 again with the salt that we've got. And we use the resulting key in IV to decrypt the master key, use that uh, resulting master key to decrypt the first sector of the encrypted image. If the password is correct, the plain text will be revealed. So this is a screenshot from an initial tool. Um, don't worry if you can't see it too well. Um, but you can definitely see the pattern there. The one on the left has been decrypted successfully. It's a bunch of zeros. The one on the right looks like random data. It's still encrypted. Cracking the pin takes seconds. That's the weakness here. Cracking a password may not take much longer. This password for encryption is the same password that's used for the lock screen. So you, people aren't going to want to enter a 32 character password every time they want to make a phone call. So with patterns, uh, easy, short passwords, it is definitely possible to brute force this. Um, this is just a proof of concept Python script. Uh, as we released it open source. So I'll mention the link at the end. Um, and we've actually got a guy, Andrei Belenko from Russia, joining our team uh, very soon. He's the brains behind the Elcom Soft GPU cracking software, so you can expect this to get a lot better. Actually, I just want to mention there's a mistake on this screenshot. You'll see at the start of the, of the data, um, it's all zeros except for the first sector. That's because I got the ESSIV wrong. So it was able to decrypt the rest of the sector because um, cipher block chaining depends on the cipher text of one block being fed as the IV into the next block. We obviously have the cipher text, so we can still decrypt the data. Um, that ESS, ESS IV issue will be f actually fixed in the real thing. Ah, let's talk about some other ones. Evil made attack. I actually thought this was called French made attack. I don't know where I got that from. Okay, so. You leave your device in a hotel room, that's the idea, and while you're out, the evil maid comes in and they have physical access to your device, but maybe they can't decrypt it. So they load an app onto your system partition because that's not encrypted. They wait for you to boot your phone, then they have remote access to your decrypted user data if their app has remote access. Rootkit, uh, easy to compile for Android, you just compile a Linux kernel module for Android, it's no big deal. And that you, know, you can hide yourself in the system really easily. It's very hard to detect for the average user, especially. Evil USB charger, it's been done. You plug your device into an outlet. Maybe you don't trust it. Behind it is an evil, uh, evil device that maybe it charges your phone. But it also runs uh, these attacks we've been talking about and gets access uh, to your device. Reverse shell, um, I did this demo a little while ago. Um, uh, concept based on a presentation by Lookout guys uh, a while back. It's, it's quite an old um, concept. And basically we created an app that had no permissions. It looked pretty safe to install. Um, you install it and even though it has no permissions, as soon as the user locks their phone screen or perhaps on a timer somewhere, sometime at night, it will connect back to us and give us a reverse shell. It uses no exploits, it uses a web browser to transmit data. By calling a web browser with data in the URL, 
it's able to pass data out. It then retrieves data from the web browser um, and uses URL handlers to pass the data back to the malicious Android app. There's a video of it online if you, if you want to try it out uh, or have a look at that. It's called uh, No Permissions Reverse Shell. Hey, there are lots of techniques. We could run a whole day workshop on, on this stuff, so I just thought I'd do a couple of fun ones. Hard reset. Unbelievable. You hard reset your device, it wipes your data. But on some devices prior to uh, 3.0, the wipe didn't work properly. So you hard reset the device, you then have access to it, you know, you, there's no lock screen anymore, you root it, and then you image it, and you get the person's data. Takes balls though, because you might just destroy the evidence and somebody's not going to be very happy. Chip off. This is really hardcore stuff. This is where you desolder the NAND chips and you put them into a special reader. Very tiny, very hard, pretty easy to uh, destroy the NAND flash chips with, uh, um, while you're trying to desolder them, especially after a few beers. But uh, it's definitely a technique, take, takes expertise. Um, kind of not much defense to that other than encryption with a strong passphrase, right? Screen smudges. Hey, if you're desperate, look at the screen smudges and see if you can work out what the pattern was that they entered. Custom update.zip. So an update.zip, this is a method for Android devices to update you have the update in a zip file and you put it onto the micro SD card if your device has a micro SD card and then when you boot it up into, uh, uh, into the recovery you can apply that update. Problem is on a stock device uh, these devices need to be signed by the manufacturer. If you, you know, if you haven't unlocked the bootloader or anything like that, it's not going to run your custom update zip. If you could run your custom update zip, you can put your own binaries in it, give, you, give yourself a shell or copy the data off. It's pretty cool. So the question is, can you get one signed? You know, uh, hey, has anybody here got a universally signed update zip? No? Yeah, one over there? I, I don't, I just, I just put my hand up. Um, I was watching this American show, The Mentalist, and uh, he was using these um, mental te techniques. That doesn't sound right. Um, no, he, he was social engineering people, and what he would do is he would uh, ask a question, who murdered Jane Doe, and then he'd put his hand up, and it would be more likely that the murderer would put the hand up. So a few months ago, I gave a similar talk to this uh, in London, um, and it was attended by a lot of law enforcement personnel. FBI, Met Police. So I was curious if anybody had a universally signed update zip. Put my hand up and one guy actually put his hand up and admitted that he did. Yeah, he, he, was, um, he was a nice chap, he was from Israel and uh, we, he came up to the end and, and we had a good, a good talk. And the third point there about uh, owning a CA, who doesn't these days, right? Um, where you man in the middle of the connection, you can push an update. You know, it's a joke, I mean, yeah, okay, CAs are getting owned, but really, who owns a CA? This guy from Israel, he's pretty interested in this technique. So, maybe it's possible. And actually, I have seen update.zip signed, and they're locked to specific IMEI numbers or specific serial numbers of the device. Um, I can't say where you can get them from, but in a legitimate law enforcement investigation, it may be possible, I'm choosing my words carefully here, um, it may be possible to get one of these update zips to gain access with a warrant to, uh, to a suspect's device. Race condition. I mentioned this earlier when uh, I had the diagram up on the screen, so we thought we'd try a race condition because we were looking at the Android source code in the recovery image and um, we noticed when applying an update, what it would do is it would read the update.zip and check the signature and if the signature was correct, it would then read it again and apply the update. Hmm. So we thought, well, hey, why don't we create a device that emulates a micro SD card? When it reads it the first time, we'll give it a legitimate one. When it reads it a second time, we'll supply our malicious one and get our update applied. 
Uh, this was actually fixed quite early on, so it didn't work, and there were issues around caching as well, but it was definitely uh, possible on some devices. Entry via Google Play. If you leave your computer logged on at home and your Google Play credentials are cached, so there's, you know, people can get onto your desktop and uh, that they can automatically log into Google Play, they can push an update, uh, sorry, push an app out to your phone. Um, I actually made an app called Screen Lock Bypass. It's free, it's in the market. And you can push this app out to a phone and it, what it will do is it will call an API call to disable the lock screen. It's a legitimate API call if somebody, you know, if an app needs to disable the lock screen because you've got an incoming call, that's how it does it. Uh, this doesn't work on newer Android devices, ice cream sandwich uh, and on because it's a security issue so they fixed it. Okay, so some of the tools um, that I mentioned earlier, um, we've created or we are creating an open source Linux distribution called Santoku. Um, you can go and download it now, it's just the alpha version. Um, I had some technical issues uh, trying to get this ready for the con, so at the moment it's a, a remix of OWASP's MobySec, and, uh, but we're going to continue forking it or expanding it. And there's a bunch of tools on there that you can use to play about with Android. Uh, and iOS and, and, and BlackBerry. So it's a, it's a community project. There's a bunch of security pros from other companies that are contributing to it. And uh, we w want to use it for um, mobile app security, malware analysis, and forensic. It's what we do in our day job. So, you know, let's create a distro. We use it in our day job and we'll give it away to the community as well. And hopefully, people will contribute to it. Okay, I think we're going to step back a few slides. Hang on. So um, I, I forgot to mention a few things on this screen I just uh, recalled. Um, whoops. So um, I'm just going to leave it there so I can, I can see it on my screen. Um, the second screenshot below is actually of a, a Nexus S, so you can actually see how we're mounting the YAFS partition after we get access to the device and the user data footer is actually a file in there. Um, in Santoku Linux, we, are, we have uh, the script to automatically brute force the pin. Um, we're hoping to work uh, on a GUI version to make this nice and easy too, and work on the Samson, uh, Samson tool as well, because Samson is different, the encryption is different. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so I'm finishing early here. I just wondered if there's any questions. Anybody wants to uh, share experiences or ask questions on the floor? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, pattern lock? Okay. So um, the, it, the question was how is the pattern lock stored and, and how, how do you crack it? Um, we, we've, We've done this before, we've also released a script to do this. The pattern lock is nine points on the screen. It's, um, and it's stored as uh, numbers zero to, uh, zero to eight. These are stored as bytes in a pattern lock file. And th that byte is then hashed. And if you can retrieve the hash, uh, you can then crack it. It's not salted either, so you can do a dictionary attack on this. Or just brute force it, there are, there are less than a million combinations so you can brute force it in seconds. It's a similar principle. Um, it's called gesture.key, stored uh, on the Android system. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. 
Have you guys come up with any uh, countermeasure programs that when you try looking into the phone, cause it to immediately wipe? Uh, yes. So the idea being that, uh, so what's the first thing a forensic investigator does? Maybe they plug the USB cable in. Well, you can detect that, right? You can detect that the USB cable is being plugged in and power has been applied. So you, if you have an app that uh, uses a standard, AG, uh, standard API um, uh, broadcast intent, so when it detects power being applied to the phone, it then triggers some code. You could either reboot the device if it's encrypted, or even better, if it's a rooted device, you could actually wipe the master key so that even if you know the password and you're forced to give it up, nobody's going to be able to uh, decrypt that data on your device. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, the encryption's the same. Um, we actually did this on a Jelly Bean device as well, a uh, Galaxy Nexus, I think it was. The encryption is actually good. It's just dependent on the strength of your passphrase. On Samsung devices, it actually, well, at least on my Galaxy Note, it forces you to use a secure password. You can't use a PIN number. Um, but again, people use patterns on their keyboard, that kind of thing. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so the, the question was, was there a password we've encountered we couldn't crack? Um, we're, we're still new on cracking passwords on Android. Um, it's, it's still emerging, so no, there hasn't been any thus far, but maybe there will be. And the second question is about iOS devices. So iOS, iOS devices, I'm not an expert, but we have them in our company. Um, they're a bit different because that automatically decrypts itself on boot. So Android encryption, in, in my opinion, is actually better because it's full device encryption with a pre-boot authentication. On an iOS device, you turn it on, it boots up, and it's decrypting the data. Uh, you need to enter your lock screen password to, to actually get into it. But there are techniques to get into the device and start pulling the data off, and it will decrypt itself automatically as you're pulling the data off. Um, so it, it's different. Um, with iOS devices, you obviously have uh, the, the encryption. Uh, the AES is actually on the chip, um, and it's rate limited, so it takes a while. But yeah, it, it's possible in a different way. Yeah. Yeah, it, sorry, what's the question? OK. So the question was, is there a way to decouple the pre-boot pin or password from the lock screen. Um, not that I know of in stock Android. Obviously, you've got custom Android distributions. That's the beauty about it. And you can, you can modify it to, uh, to do that if you wanted. Um, that, that would be the ideal thing to do, because you could enter your secure password, passphrase, long and complicated when you boot up, which you do infrequently, and then uh, an easier one on the lock screen. Yeah. So you saw the video earlier where we used the, the HID device to automatically enter information. Um, we, haven't found, we haven't found any vulnerabilities on the, like the HID protocol itself. I mean, um, I mean, because you can replace the keyboard as an app, and that will run to allow the user to enter their passwords, right? So. Yeah, well, the, so there's a keyboard on the pre-boot authentication screen, right? Uh, so yeah, the, there's, a, there's an app that runs that, but that doesn't have access to the passphrase or it doesn't cache it or anything like that. Um, it's not saved to the user dictionary because um, the, the user data partition is um, it's only, when, when you enter your password or PIN, it tries to decrypt the user data partition and it knows if it's successful or not um, by whether or not it decrypts or not. That's how it works. So. Um, I, unless I misunderstand your question, I, I don't think there's a way to do that. Good question. Yeah. So um, the question was, have you ever encountered a law enforcement rootkit? Uh, I, I can't answer that one. <laughs> OK, guys. Any more? OK. 
Okay, I'd, uh, thanks for coming and for staying till the end. Um, sorry, I got through a bit quicker than I uh, expected. Uh, I'd like to thank a few people, Google, for making an awesome uh, phone, uh, and the other guys there, and uh, Tim as well, for having a look at my slides. Uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs>